Welcome to the Bull 10 Mentoros video series where we talk all things personal finance with industry leaders. Um, today, I am super excited to be joined by an amazing guest, um, Free of Gage Street Society. Um, she is an accomplished financial mentor with more than 13 years in the financial <laughs> service industry. Um, she actually helps her clients master their money by using um, academic, professional, and experiential lessons to kind of help them achieve financial freedom. So we're super excited to jump into our interview today. We're going to talk about some really cool topics today. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Free. Yes. Hi, Haven. It is an absolute pleasure. And I'm excited for the conversation today. Yes, we are too. Well, um, we're actually kind of excited to jump in. I was going to say, I was just telling you before we started this interview that this might be our number one most requested topic. Um, and our, I know a lot of our money mentors <laughs> like to jokingly call it the four letter D word, uh, but it's not the one you're thinking, it's debt. So um, <laughs> I was going to say, I know you have a lot of experience kind of coaching your clients to overcome debt. And um, I know you're here to kind of help us change your, our mindsets and take some yeah. practical steps around this topic. So, um, but I wanted to kind of get a little bit of an idea of your background before we get too far into our, our debt conversation. Um, what made you so passionate about educating others about this topic and others? And uh, did you always know that this is what you were made to do? Absolutely. Now, I haven't <laughs> always like done it professionally, but it's always been a passion of mine. I personally think that a passion pursued becomes a movement for the masses. And so essentially I started learning about personal finance as um, a teenager. So in high school, I am a self-proclaimed money nerd. I wear that badge very proudly, but um, before I started helping people, I was helping myself and just kind of learning the fundamentals of budgeting, debt management, and like how to start building credit as a 16, 17, 18 year old in high school, right? But in high school, when you're 18, you don't really have the life experience to like, then go out in the world and like tell other people what to do with their money, because you haven't really lived. So I decided to go to college and kind of take the safer route, mastered and majored in accounting and then went corporate. So I spent over to your point, over a decade, 13 years in the financial services industry as a forensic accountant. Meanwhile, my passion always being personal finance, always being financial literacy. And so while in corporate, I was helping corporations kind of dissect their financials and help them understand how to manage their money, um, invest their money, so on and so forth. In my personal life, I was assisting myself and then what became, you know, my family and friends on how to build wealth, budget effectively, manage their debt, eliminate their debt. Um, and then also mm. start the investing process again through the stock market, right? So, right. Um, and then during the during the pandemic, right? So I think a lot of us kind of not only were we in quarantine, literally, but it was kind of a time for us to reflect. And so during that time, I did some reflection, and what came out of that was Gay Street Society. And so I retired myself from corporate America after over a decade. Um, and started a business, just kind of decided to jump out on faith, step outside of my comfort zone, if you will, Absolutely. and launch Gay Street Society, which was focused on really helping individuals because I spent my corporate profession helping corporations. So that was my yeah. opportunity <laughs> to really help individuals kind of launch, you know, their financial journey and take the personal lessons that I learned since teenager, the information that I'd amassed now over 20 years later oh, wow. know, as oh an adult, so awesome. <laughs> nearly 20 years later as an adult, right? So now I, not only did I have the academics and um, the passion for it, I now had the experience, right? So I was, right. if I'm teaching someone how to eliminate their debt, it's because I've had to eliminate $15,000 of debt in eight months, right? Right. So I have That's that amazing. experience as well. That's such an incredible accomplishment, um, just all around, honestly, transitioning from corporate to owning your own business is, sounds like a huge um, achievement and just such an amazing uh, journey. So I really appreciate you sharing about that. And I'm a, I'm impressed also about this 15,000 of debt. Um, that's a very, I was gonna say a scary number for many of our members. I'm sure they share maybe that number or higher of, uh, of that debt. And I know you kind of mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd love to kind of talk a little bit about 
what has been happening in the world and the economy since that pandemic. I know many of our members have kind of reported struggling with inflation and we know there, I have some scary statistics I kind of want to share in this interview so we can go ahead and jump into those. But I know consumer debt is currently, unfortunately, at an all time high. Um, and as of 2023, I think it's sitting at about $17.29 trillion. So just a little bit um, there. And I know the current um, debt to income ratio, which you may define later, is about almost 10%, right Right at like 9.8%. So that kind of means that the additional, the average American is spending nearly 10% of their monthly income on these debt payments. Um, and so mm-hmm. credit card uh that also is kind of at an all-time high as well. It's a uh, 6,365, I, th- I believe, as of um, the end of 2023. And so just kind of, I think for many of our members, when they hear these numbers, they sound familiar and they kind of sound depressing <laughs> of just um, mm-hmm. kind of feeling overwhelmed about your debt. So I would love if you could share with us um, just your expertise on common reasons why people tend to fall into debt and how it actually impacts your financial well-being overall. Yeah, so that those are really scary numbers. Um, And I often kind of have those numbers in the back of my mind as I'm helping my clients and my students. Um, But to answer your question, I think one thing that I've seen through working with different clients is that the number one reason people amass debt is essentially because they have a financial need that is larger than their bank account, right? Right. because if we all started or if we all had millions of dollars, I don't know <laughs> if there would be a demand, right, for debt right. and credit cards, mortgages, so on and so forth. So that's kind of the number one reason. For example, when you go to buy a house, you know, um, very rarely do people write $350,000 checks for houses, right? And then the same thing for cars and auto loans. So that's the number one reason is because your, um, the, your need it kind of outsizes the amount of income that you're bringing in. Right. To your point about the inflation though, because what I've historically, what I've seen is that we've used debt for big things, mortgage, car, right? Those big purchases that make us feel right. like we're adulting, right? Gracefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> just but, true. With, but with inflation, what has happened is in inflation, is essentially the rise in prices over or goods and services over time, right? And so what's happened is instead of it just being, or instead of us just needing debt for those big things, we now, Mm -hmm. a lot of us are amassing debt for the basic necessities, right? Right. So I don't know if you recall during the pandemic when there was like this huge craze about eggs because they were $12 more, right? So it's like, yes. And groceries over time, you know, inflation has impacted milk and bread and like the things we need. I mean, I don't need bread, but I need bread. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yes. Right? <laughs> but those basic necessities. And so now we are, instead of it just being for those big items, those big ticket purchases, we are amassing credit card debt to pay off the basic necessities. And yeah, I think that's kind of the part that if I take a step back, um, I oftentimes work with my clients and my students to kind of right size that ship and, and mm-hmm. build those expenses more into the budget from an income perspective. So they're not so reliant on the debt as a crutch to pay for their basic necessities. Absolutely. I think that that is a, a really um, insightful comment. And I, I can totally see just how um, with the rise of inflation that debt, you know, carrying consumer debt or this credit card debt, which carries, unfortunately, such high interest rates, like credit card debt is um, one of the most common forms of debt, but it's also one of the um, most un- I guess, damaging ones to your, um, your journey because it's so high interest. And so, um, it's important to, uh, yeah, prioritize that. So I love that. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe also give us, um, some idea of some misconceptions that people might have about debt. Cause I think sometimes, uh, we hear different financial influencers or educators say that, you know, debt is always really, really bad and you need to avoid it at all costs. And like, it's just the worst thing you could possibly ever do. Um, or maybe sometimes people are saying like, no, credit cards are awesome. You should try 
try to have as many as possible and, you know, try to get your points game on and um, yeah. you know, don't worry yeah. about that. So I know there's a lot of misconceptions just in the finance world on debt and debt management. So what are some that you come across and would you be able to debunk some of those for us? Yeah. So um, you hit kind of both ends of the spectrum where you have <laughs> individuals that completely shy away from debt for a multitude of reasons, credit cards, um, you know, cars, they pay for in cash and things like that. You use cars and then you have Even houses, folks that, houses yeah. as well. Right. And then you have the individuals right. that have like 15 credit cards, they're travel hacking and just doing oh, all yeah. the things for the points benefit. Um, right. I am probably somewhere in the middle, uh, but also from a different perspective. So to answer your question, I think some of the common misconceptions about debt is that like all debt is bad, right? Or all debt is good, right? So it's, it's having those extreme viewpoints. What I would encourage the listeners to maybe think about is I, I think about it from the perspective of are you using debt? as a tool or a crutch. Mm. So from the, from the perspective of using it as a tool, people obtain mortgages, you have a loan, you, you know, live in the house for a couple of years and then you may sell that house and it has appreciated in value. Now you can pay off your mortgage loan and, you know, retire if you will, right? Or use that profit to do something with. Your mortgage right. has, your mortgage in that scenario is a tool because your house has appreciated and you turned a profit from the sale of that home, right? right. Um, or right. you stayed in the home and now you can leverage the appreciation to do X, Y, and Z. Where debt becomes a crutch is when we are, how do I say this nicely? Well, we are using, we're essentially using debt to afford a lifestyle that our income doesn't pay for, right? Mm. And so not only are we doing that, so we're overextending ourselves essentially um, and then using debt as that crutch literally to keep us afloat. Um, right. And then on, on top of that, because the income isn't necessarily accounted for, there may be situations where we have missed payments, we have higher interest rates, we have lower credit scores. So it then starts to kind of snowball. Um, mm, and so right. that is kind of the per perspective um, that I give to, to my clients and my students about misconceptions or good debt versus bad debt. Yeah, I love the way you phrase that. I think that's so insightful. And I think that really is important to acknowledge. I know we're having a conversation on how to get rid of debt today, and we're going to talk about practical strategies. But it is important to note that, you know, debt isn't 100% like the worst financial decision you could be making. Correct. It's actually can be used as a tool, um, which I love that phrasing. I think that um, debt, your ability to take on debt actually signals that you have financial power um, and your ability to pay that off also is another um, aspect of your power there so love that yeah exactly and and debt can taking on debt in a strategic way that makes sense that does not overextend yourself can be a powerful to, powerful tool for building wealth right it was yeah one of the ways in which i was able to retire at 35 you know what i mean and we can kind of delve into that but like so i speak from experience when i say debt can be leveraged as a tool um, mm. but then when I amassed $15,000 and then had to pay it back in eight months, I was using right. it as a crutch. So right. I have both ends of experience that I can kind of see yes. from as well. Right. That's so helpful. Um, well, I was going to say, I'm dying to get to the practical of how you actually managed to pay off, um, that amount. I'm super interested in, uh, just thinking about the different types of debt. So I know we've kind of touched on that a little bit of there's maybe some good good types of debt and there's some less great <laughs> types of debt that you wanna have. How, as, how can you as kind of a member um, prioritize your debts and determine which ones to tackle first? Yes, so great question. The very first thing I would tell you to do is lay it all out in front of you, right? So okay. if you're using, mm -hmm. an, if you're using the avalanche method, the snowball method, the very first thing you want to do is kind of understand what the picture looks like. What What is your debt profile? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you have mortgages if or a mortgage, if you have auto loans, if you have credit cards, how many credit cards do you have, right? And not only 
okay, my creditor, for example, is, you know, Bank of America, but how much is that loan or how much are those loans? You also want to know what those interest rates are, what your due dates are. I think oftentimes we as humans, right, we make payments and they're going out on different days at different times. And so it's kind of piecemeal. Your first step is to bring that all together, right? And understand Mm -hmm. what that debt profile looks like. The second step is to say, okay, um, do what approach do I want to take or what method do I want to take? Do I want to use the snowball method, the avalanche method? And I know I think we're going to talk a little bit about those, but yes. um, then decide on a strategy, right? Once you know what your debt profile looks like. If you're using kind of a snowball method, you're going to take the smallest debt first. Um, and then if you're using the avalanche method, you're going to take the debt with the highest interest rate first. Um, okay. And then there's two other methods, but we can talk about all that. But essentially, <laughs> the first thing you want to do is lay out the debt and kind of put it all out on the table so you understand kind of where you're starting from. And that can be a daunting process, like seeing yeah. 326,000, you know what I mean? Like some of those numbers can get very um, jarring, but mm. that's the first step. The second step is then to select a strategy. And then the third step is, I say, laser focus in on that first debt that you've decided making the minimum payments on all the other debts because you don't want it to adversely impact your credit score right um right right. but then we're kind of laser focused in at that point and then once that first debt is paid off you just kind of keep keep the train chugging along um to those subsequent debts until they're all paid off yeah that makes a ton of sense um i think that's so helpful especially thinking about you know how to prioritize your debts um so i love that um and i'm curious so we you kind of hinted on some strategies of someone who might be looking to create a really realistic and achievable debt repayment plan um how do you fit that in with all the rest of your financial uh, obligations like maybe savings or investing or different things like that yeah so that's a really great question um The very first thing I would say is we want to be honest with ourselves and we want to be accurate with our numbers. Um, And what I mean by that is when you're ready to start this debt-free journey, right, or debt management journey, first you want to lay out and lay out what your debts are, right, and really kind of hone in on what does my debt profile look like? Um, How many credit cards do I have? If I have a mortgage, an auto loan, right? Do I have any personal loans to family members and friends that I need to kind of pay off, right? Um, Any medical bills, you know, and medical loans that I need to pay off. So first thing is to make, yeah, is to make a list of what your debt profile looks like. In that, in that list, you're going to include the creditors, the totals, your interest rates, your payment dates. Um, your minimum balances, et cetera. I will say there's actually a really easy way the members can do this if you're not wanting to just use an Excel sheet or a piece of paper. Um, I, you may have already been about to talk about it, but the Mentoro portal has this really cool uh, tool called the debt tool where you can actually plug in a lot of that info. So I just wanted to throw that in there, but yes, that sounds uh, really helpful to, to lay that all out. Yes, so absolutely. If you um, are not on Mentoro, do that because it does all the hard work for you. But essentially, you want to understand so nice. what kind of your debt profile is. And, and then once you've done that, then you can say, okay, how much money can I realistically uh, contribute to my debt payoff journey? And so oftentimes, we want to pay off debt. We want to save. We want to invest. We also want to live, right? And so the perspective <laughs> right. that the perspective that I kind of share with individuals that I work with is, let's say your number is a uh, hundred dollars, right? For a simple math. And you want to split it between yes. a couple different buckets. If you are prioritizing debt elimination, you know, 80 to $90 may go towards debt payoff, right? If you mm-hmm. are saying, okay. okay, well, I want to be, like assertive, but not that aggressive. So maybe I'm only contributing 50 to $75 towards the debt and the, right. the remaining money is going towards savings, investing and living, right? My point is yeah. one, understand like what that accurately, what that number is. And the reason why I stress accurately is because oftentimes, sometimes we can, because we are human, we say, 
the numbers are not realistic. So we say, oh, I have $600 mm -hmm. a month to contribute to my debt when in reality it's $300. And then we get frustrated, nice. right, as to why we're not paying it off in the time that we calculate it, but it's because we have less than what we ac accurately, you know, thought we did. Right. So yeah. be realistic with that number and then you can calculate, okay, if I make payments, um, you know, it'll take me this long to pay it off, whether I'm paying, you know, all a hundred dollars, if I'm doing just, you know, 75 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever that, um, amount is that you determine. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And I think, um, kind of thinking about debt as not all being created equal mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, um, if you're trying to prioritize several different strategies at once, maybe like you have some savings goals, mm -hmm. you've got some investing goals, you want to, um, kind of allocate those differently depending on where you're at uh, with each of those things. So for me, I'm just thinking a practical example. Like if I had a very high interest credit card, um, I might want to prioritize that first. Whereas, um, if, you know, I paid that off and now I just have my mortgage, I'm not necessarily going to pay off my entire mortgage before beginning investing, because that would be quite a long time, especially in the Dallas area, I will say. So yeah, no, and that, that would take me a long. And that's a really great point. When it, when we talk about, you know, interest rates, oftentimes with our credit cards, those are revolving credits, right? So it's like you pay off the thousand right. and then you rack up the thousand and then you got to figure out how to pay it off again. So it's revolving. It kind of right. never ends if you keep using your credit card. But on the flip side of that, yes, the interest rates tend, tend to be higher than like your auto loan or your mortgage, for example. And so right. oftentimes it is a great strategy to tackle those first. And then what really helped people um, is like, yes, you've paid it off in the short term. So maybe it's taking you three months or four months, right? What we then sure. can't do is go in the next 30 to 60 days, rack up another $5,000 in credit card debt, right? Because then we're <laughs> back at square one. So, so then what we do, right. once that once that debt has been, that credit card debt has been paid off, now you have essentially disposable income. So instead of racking up the debt and, and it going back to that credit card, let's figure out how to fit that into your budget so that you're using the cash to pay for what you right. then would have put on credit cards. So we're not back in that same position in 60 days. Yes. It's so hard. I think to, um, if you've been in debt to kind of adjust your lifestyle, I'm sure that for many people, that's one of the hardest things is just, you know, coming to terms with your income <laughs> as it is currently and, um, trying to adjust your lifestyle. So it, it must be, um, so encouraging once you're able to get out of that debt, if you're able to stay out of that debt as well, um, after. So I love that point. Yeah. And then also too, it can be, now, I'm not saying don't rack up any more credit card debt ever, right? But what I am saying yeah, is right. we kind of have a mindset shift where now that the credit card debt is paid off, we're no longer using it as a crutch, right? So now, because we want to get the points and, you know, all the benefits that come with maybe having a credit card, we give ourselves an allowance, right? So monthly, we're going to spend X, X amount of dollars on our credit card. But the key is, that money is already factored into our budget. We already have that income coming right. in so we can then pay off that credit card. So it doesn't accumulate month right. over month. And for me, um, I'm, you know, was blessed to have so much um, just help from my parents that I was able to graduate from college with with no debt. And they they kind of taught me something just um, as my very kind of young person learning how to use a credit card that it's not on fire and I actually can use it. And it's a good tool yeah. um, of just almost thinking about it as if it's like a debit card, like that is just something you got to pay like rent. You know, it's like up oh, your credit card bill is due. And for me, that was a really helpful mindset shift and kind of helped me not think of my credit card as if it was on fire um, and that, as if it was a dangerous thing. Um, but just more of like, I can use this as a tool and pay it, pay it off yeah. at the end of every month. And that's just how I look at it. And that I try not to spend more on it than I can, than I actually have in my debit account. So right. that's just yeah. something I do but kind of helpful, but yeah. Um, well, I really, I, you talked earlier about these snow related analogies. So for people who may be unfamiliar, they're probably like, why are we talking about snowballs and avalanches and all this stuff? Um, I thought that was kind of for winter time. And, <laughs> um, but I am excited to kind of hear your explanation. You actually brought 
to my mind, new snow related analogies that I had not heard of um, up until that point. So excited to talk about those different approaches and how you help clients um, provide uh, kind of just great examples of how they can pay off their debt. So we'd love for you to kind of walk us through those those four, I yeah. believe, yeah. Uh, snow related <laughs> examples. Okay, awesome. Yes. So there are four um, snow related or weather related uh, methods to paying off your debt. The two most common are going to be cool. your snowball method and your avalanche method with, and then there's also the tsunami method and the snowflake method. And when it comes cool. to the snowball method, um, that is essentially where you list all of your debts from smallest to largest. So going back to that debt profile that I mentioned, in, in Mentoro, it's a really great way for you to say like, okay, smallest to largest, what are my debts? Um, then once you have that listed, you start essentially with the smallest debt and you put extra income and you, you know your income towards uh, that first debt. And so this the snowball method is really good for people who are like me, where <laughs> it may be like you as well, where you like to kind of check things off, right? Because taking the right. smallest debt first helps you build that momentum and that confidence. Because typically if it's a smaller mm -hmm. debt, you can pay it off a lot faster, right? And so what happens right. is you'll contribute not only the minimum monthly payment, but we calculate, okay, how much money can you actually, in addition to just the minimum monthly payment, can you contribute to this debt? And then how long will it, will it take for you to pay it off? Once that first debt, that first small debt is paid off, you then roll or snowball the minimum monthly payment and the uh, the amount that you're originally contributing to the first small debt into the second debt, right? And okay. so that is kind of the snowball effect. You don't take that, you know, um, let's say it was a hundred bucks and then your minimum payment was $25. You don't take the $125 right. and then go out to dinner, right? We got to keep Keep it focused on the debt. And yes. so you roll that 125 okay. into that second debt. And so with that second debt, you're yeah. paying the 125 and the minimum monthly payment. So it continues to snowball, right? Now, Absolutely. I'm curious, would you say that that actually impacts motivation to have that kind of um, the snowball effect? Because I know for some people, they may say that doesn't make sense. Like you're not paying your high interest debt first, which I know we're kind of spoiling the avalanche <laughs> a little bit, but um but would you say that that is a really motivating, just from a personal perspective, uh, kind of effect? Yes. What I found is that it helps um, It helps individuals, like, get that initial momentum, particularly when you're just okay. starting out, right? And it helps you build your confidence, right? You've, you've, you've dedicated your money towards this small debt. You see it's paid off. You see in your account that the balance is zero, like you've done it, right? It's kind of like a yeah. pat on the back, if you will. Um, right. and, and so it helps you, helps build that confidence and build your momentum to keep going. And so absolutely, mm -hmm. for people that are motivated in that way, I definitely recommend the snowball method. To your point though, okay. it doesn't really take into account the interest. So with the snowball method over time, you may be paying more interest, but if you are kind of focused on um, their interest rate, then you may want to use the avalanche method. And so with the avalanche method, essentially you are listing your debts instead of from smallest to largest by amount, you are listing from largest to smallest by interest rate. And so what that is helping you do is tackle the debt based on the amount of interest that is likely to accrue over time. Because for mm -hmm. us, individuals with debt, interest expense is not a good thing, right? Like we don't want to pay a lot in principal and a lot in interest. So with that avalanche method, mm -hmm. you're tackling the highest interest rate first, still making the minimum payments on all the other debt. So it doesn't impact, um, adversely impact your credit, but just kind of honing in on that highest interest rate. So those are two most common if you're familiar with, you know, weather related debt methods, you're, you've probably come across the avalanche and the snowball method. The other two methods okay. is the tsunami and the snowflake. So oftentimes the snowflake method is used in conjunction with either the snowball or the avalanche method. Because the, snow, okay. the snowflake method says that any extra income or any like little savings that I'm able to have throughout the month. Um, I'm going to 
put on top of the debt that mm. I'm already contributing, right? So it's like snowflakes, right? So we go outside, little snowflake here, a little snowflake there. The, the thought is that over time, the little snowflakes amass to a really big impact on your debt payoff, right? Your debt payoff strategy. Right. So it may be, for example, oh, you know, I save 20 bucks this week because I decided to cook for myself as opposed to eating out. Well, instead of, you know, maybe taking that $20 and, you know, doing something with it, you put it on top of, you know, the debt that you're mm. already paying off. I can see for some members who may like be using the cash method, if they have like, you know, a budgeting method where they're really diligent about like, okay, I have $200 of my food budget and I was $50 under this, yes. this week. What do I, you know, what do I do with that $50? I like, oh, I guess I can go shopping now with that. But um, if you allocate that towards your debt, that, that makes so much sense. Exactly. So in that instance, you're using the snowflake method, right? Um, and then the mm -hmm. other, the, the last method is the tsunami method. And oftentimes, so the tsunami method essentially says, like, I'm going to prioritize my debts based on the emotional impact that it's having on my life. So mm. with my, with some of my clients and my students, oftentimes, if they have uh, personal loans to family members or friends, and as a result, they're strained relationships, they're going to prioritize yeah. those debts first, because they want to kind of improve those relationships. Right. And not sure. allow I mean, money to be the fracture, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think that um, that's a much more nuanced way of looking at debt than simple math, because I yes. think um, most people are aware that, you know, their debt is costing them, you know, different um, financial goals that they're having. But if you're evaluating your debt from an emotional perspective, um, I love that, especially the last one that. I think that's, it plays a huge emotional impact on you. And uh, it's not just math at the end of the day. It really is. Sometimes that debt weighs heavier on you than any of the others because of, uh, you know, some other dynamics there. So I, I love that approach. I think that gives people flexibility and freedom to just really um, make the financial choice that's right for them. Yes, absolutely. So four methods, um, your snowball, your avalanche, your tsunami, and your snowflake. Love that. Yes, you should definitely schedule a one-on-one -on -one with Free. She could uh, help you figure out which one is right for you um, and kind of your situation. Because like we've been saying, everybody is different. Personal finance is so personal. So that's a really uh, helpful template, though. I love that. Cool. Well, would love to kind of uh, conclude our time together on a positive note. I know debt can be kind of a heavy topic and can be a challenging one to talk through, but um, I would love if you could share a good debt success story. I know that those are so motivating <laughs> to those of us who are in debt. Um, is there a case study of someone who effectively followed some of your debt reduction strategies and improved their financial situation? Um, so I had a client reach out to me in December um, of 2023, and they essentially had student loans, right? Now, it wasn't their student loans. Mm -hmm. It was student loans that they'd gotten for their children. Um, but like many people, they hadn't paid a student loan payment for three years, right, oh. with the federal payment pause. So right. it wasn't in the last, you know, two and a half, three years, it wasn't factored into their budget because it didn't need to be, right? Um, yeah, right. And so what, what ended up happening was they came to me and they said, hey, Free, like, we have to now figure out how to come up with about $850 a month to make Ouch. these student loan payments. Um, we, you know... Unfortunately, we weren't, none of our student loans were forgiven. So, you know, we have to kind of start this out. And if you recall, mm -hmm. the federal student loan payment pause, that's a tongue twister, ended in October. Well, it ended in September and then payments started in October, right, of 2023. Right. And here I am talking to right. them in December of 2023. So uh, going forward into 2024, they had to figure out how to come up with $850 in their and they didn't really have any disposable income. Um, and then also, because it was kind of two months since the payments had started, they were, <clears throat> excuse me, they were about $2,000 uh, behind in past, in like missed payments. So their account- It's not as if it was Christmas or anything too, uh, around that time. They're probably like, yeah, we're also buying presents and all this stuff. So oh, a, that sounds like a tough situation. Yes, a, exactly. So um, you can imagine the scenario and circumstances and just like the yeah. stress that they were in kind of at that time. 
Um, and so right. what I was able to, so essentially what we had to do was one of two things. We either had to figure out how to come up with $850 and like redirect that to the student loan payments or figure out a way to completely wipe that $850 um, obligation from them for short term or long term. And so um, what ended up happening was we were able to defer their payments for nine months um, based on the types of loans that they had. And with that, they were able to aggressively pay off some of the other debt, which then in that time span would free up that $850 so that when the nine months came, they could then start making those timely payments on time. And so they were relieved, right? And they were um, super relieved that for nine months, they didn't have to make those uh, those payments of $850. And then also we were able to work with the, the debt, the creditor to completely wipe away that two, $2,000 in past due payments. Wow. So their account was That's brought amazing. active. They had them, you know, and so it was really a moment where we were like cheersing and like high fiving, and it was great yeah. because at the end of that, you know, session, they came into the session being kind of stressed and not really knowing what their options were, right. and they walked away from the session. They thought they were going to come into the session having to like make a payment that day, and right. they didn't. Right, oh. and not only did they not have to make a payment that day their account was brought active and they actually didn't have to make a payment for the next nine months. And so that was, oh I was relieved for them and, you know, they were relieved and we were kind of really ecstatic about that. So that's one of my kind of proud that's moments. That, that's what makes it all yeah. worth it seriously for me. I bet. I, I think that's such a crazy, I mean, that is a truly deeply impactful kind of event for someone's life to have that, um, that debt temporarily relieved um, just so that they can kind of get their finances in order and prepare. I think so many were pe- people were unfortunately counting on this um, student loan forgiveness. And so when it was revoked, I think it was um, a huge financial challenge for people. So um, yeah, debt is a, a very heavy thing, but it's really cool that you were able to uh, lighten the load for, for those people. So I love that. Well, Free, this has been an absolute pleasure kind of talking to you about debt. And I've really appreciated your perspective. You have such a, a cool story and how you help others and kind of have dedicated your life to really just, yeah, serving others through this way. So it's super cool. And um, I would love for you to kind of tell us and tell our viewers where they can find out more about you and your story and kind of uh, engage with you better. Yeah, absolutely. So become a member of Mentoro and you can book sessions directly with me as a money mentor. I love to kind of help you with kind of your debt debt journey, um, your debt management plan, and all the things. Like, that's something I'm really excited and really passionate about. Um, So you can find me on Mentoro. And additionally, I also create a financial safe space and provide money management tips on social media at Gage Street Society. So that's Gage, G-A-G-E-S-T, Society on, you know, your Facebooks, your Instagrams, and your TikToks. Awesome. (laughs) We'll link that in the bio for sure so you guys can click there. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you, Free. Again, you're such a pleasure, and I really have appreciated all your insights. Um, I feel like I learned so much in this interview. So thank you so much for joining us, and thank you guys for tuning in. Catch us next time in the bullpen. Thank you. Bye.